Welcome everyone to the 2021 Virtual SMA Conference. This is Jessica from Cure SMA's Family Support Department, and we thank you all so much for joining us for the Getting in the Pool with and without a pandemic session today. We're grateful to our national presenting sponsors, Biogen, Genentech, and Novartis Gene Therapies for their incredible support of this year's Virtual SMA Conference. Uh, please note that all lines are muted during the session other than for the speakers. And then you'll see that there's a chat conversation tab located on the right side of your screen, and you can use this to ask questions throughout the session. And now we would like to introduce our speaker, Jennifer Martin, a physical therapist. Um, she also gave a presentation earlier this week on Tuesday, so if you did not get a chance to check that out, um, please view the, the practical side of the pool session. And now we'll get started with today. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me, Cure SMA, for inviting me back to National Conference and for our sponsors for making this happen in such a crazy year. I love National Conference because to me it's a chance to talk about being in the water with those who love it and those who fear it and hopefully moving those from the fear side to the love side to collaborate on ideas about what's working for people now, what are people doing in the water that's great and where can they get some extra support and in this time of covid that has been crazy but it's been a great opportunity for us to really be collaborative and think ahead in the big picture for water access and water safety both from a pulmonary side from just a general water safety side and from a community virus side um, and general safety and I love learning from folks about what you're doing because I learn something at every national conference. I will learn something at this national conference for sure. Um, and hopefully I will give you something to take back to your pool, to your community, to your therapist, to your clients um, in regards to how do I access the water? How do I make it work better for me? Uh, and how can I use it really to keep me healthy and independent? What do I bring to the aquatic discussion? I have been a physical therapist for the last 25 years, and I have been in the water for the last 25 years. I have had the opportunity to work with kids and adults. I staffed the muscular dystrophy clinic uh, at one of the local hospitals. I work in the pediatric ICU, and I have had the opportunity to work um, on the clinic side so in gravity, in pediatrics, orthopedics, and sports medicine. And of course, a little bit of time in the pool, which is, okay, my favorite part. Uh, I founded Wave Therapies in 2001 because I really wanted the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with folks in an aquatic setting to provide independence and health and a safe place to move and to figure out how you can use your body in a world without gravity. My current practice has kids from age as young as six months uh, up to age 86. The other day I saw a nine month old, so we sang the ABCs all morning long, uh, and my oldest client that day was 82, and we debated current politics. And I love that ability to span generations. I have no disclosures, but I do have sheets. Um, I can get exercise sheets and lists of where we purchase our products, and they're attached to this presentation. Uh, so feel free to download those. And if you'd like to contact me directly, my email is listed right there, and I would love it since I don't get to have direct contact um, with any of you in the water this year, then uh, I would love that contact by email, um, or feel free to submit your questions here also. Next slide, please. There are three things I want you to take away from this time. Three points that I want you to mull over and take back. What does the water give you that gravity doesn't allow? What can you get from putting, getting, putting on your suit or your shirt and t-shirt, your t-shirt and shorts and getting in the water that you can't get in gravity? Um, how do you maximize your water safety, both from a personal standpoint and from a bigger pandemic viewpoint? Where and how do you even start? We're not going to get into a lot of specific exercises in this 
presentation, but if you want to look at some real specifics, what do I do? How do I start? How do I progress things? Um, pull up that talk that, that happened earlier this week and take a look at that, and hopefully that'll give you some great places to start. Next slide, please. The water allows for active motion with the greatest independence. The greatest independence for my, the folks that I work with that are full-time chair users, so much of their world is dependent on technology or external support. But when you get in the water, that independence is so much greater. Now, sometimes that requires extra flotation support or weight supports, but the ability to move your body independently and through space is a unique situation that we find in the water. It provides unique socialization opportunities that you can't get in your chair because oftentimes your chair is, uh, can be seen by others as a barrier to communication. But when you're all in the water, everybody's body is the same. Everybody's moving. Everybody is a head and shoulders above the surface. And it's a great equalizer. And it allows for positions that can't be obtained in other venues easily or, safe, or safely. I have folks that um, are full-time chair users and are swimming on their stomach with a full face snorkel. On land, they would never be on their stomach. They can't do the hip flexion contractures. Due to too much pressure on their chest, they can't breathe that way. But in the water, they can be independent and active on their stomach, using their arms in a different way, using their hips in a way they can't on land. It is the great equalizer, and it allows for so much active independence. Next slide, please. Why is the water better? Clearly, I'm a little biased, but here's why I am biased. The water provides complete sensory input, except for maybe around your face, because not everybody wants to get their face wet, right? Everywhere else, the water completely surrounds you. And the more you move, the more that sensory input occurs at your hands, at your elbows, at your knees, places where if you have limited mobility or a full-time chair user, that sensory input just doesn't occur. I saw, um, worked with the young man for years, and he said, he loved to swim on his back. He was a fish. He said, Jen, could you just let me hit my head on the wall, please, when we get to the end? Now, understand that he had a full neck collar on. He could not really hit his head, but he could get kind of close. And I said, well, I, I can, but why, why do I want to do this? Why would I let you hit your head on the wall? He goes, Jen. I spend my entire day in my chair. I never bump into anything. I just want to bump into something because I want to know what it feels like. Okay. He never swam fast enough that he could hurt himself, but that feeling of hitting the wall and bouncing off it, he loved it. And we did it for weeks, week after week, for years, just so he could get that sensory input. The water provides all types of sensory input, and I, am, I love it for that. It provides postural support, 75% body weight removed if you have the water at mid chest deep, 75%. So that gives you enough to kind of anchor yourself to the bottom of the pool, but the water really supports you from there. Now, sometimes we need to give floats noodles or extra floats or extra weights for balance, but that support is there provided by the water. That's huge. Now, I can make that more challenging by adding some speed or resistance cuffs and make you have to work there, or I can just work on balance and really give your body the chance to stretch out and just enjoy being in that upright anti-gravity position, but without uncomfortable supports. The water gives you that chance for active and active assisted range of motion. You can be super active, moving your arms, moving your legs in an anti-gravity situation that you can't do on land. And I can help. I can give you a little extra shove or an extra 
stretch at the end of a motion to give you that extra assisted range of motion that is just not comfortable for many in a gravity-filled environment. There are multiple physiologic benefits from being in the water. There's the cardiopulmonary benefit of just having that pressure to breathe against the water against your chest. That is an exercise in and of itself. And I've had people say, what if I just got in the water? Because it feels really good. I love taking that pressure off my back and off my hips. But sometimes I just sit there and I just breathe and I feel like I've done a good job. And I'll tell you, if you're getting in the water and you're taking that pressure off your spine and you just breathe against the pressure, for some people, that is the perfect exercise. And I'll tell you if that's where you're at, then it's perfect for that. The water helps with digestion because if we can get your legs, your hip flexors, your the front of your torso stretched out a little bit, we can let the digestive process happen and let things drain better. And that's a big deal. The water pressure on your legs in the water pushes that fluid that settles in your feet and in your calves back up, runs that back through your kidneys and helps to get that fluid processed. And that's a big deal. And it's socially engaging. It's a great place to meet other people, to interact with other people, and truly just be seen as the individual that you are. I am fortunate that I work in a community pool. So we have a chance to interact with people that are in from the community doing their exercises. And my clients that are in for therapy, again, doing their exercises, all of us just in the pool, all of us just being people that wanna take care of our bodies. And that is a great opportunity that we have in the water that can't always be found as easily on land. Next slide, please. Every time I get in the water with every single patient, regardless of how long I have known them, I'm always aware of pool safety. It's a great freeing environment, but I'm always aware of making sure that we're maximizing safety from how do we get in and out safe how do we keep folks safe once we're in the pool? Safety includes how you handle your health needs and how you evaluate the right pool setting for you. I use this deck lift for many of my patients because we can transfer from their wheelchair. I can have someone keep them stable in the chair, provide head support if we need it, provide extra trunk support if we need it. Um, and we can lower them into the water with their assistant still holding for support. And then once they're in the water, I can reach up and support and we can get folks right in. But it's a matter of planning that safety aspect out and knowing how are you gonna get in and out. Safety in the time of COVID, holy cow, in a pool, it has provided a whole new sense of consideration. But the reality is, what I think about now as far as folks being safe in a pool in the time of COVID relates directly to flu season, right? A lot of folks that are listening to this understand that COVID is, COVID is huge and obviously a national issue, but for folks that are immunocompromised, flu season is just as panicky as COVID in that if you're immunocompromised, getting the flu can provide you an opportunity to be in the ER or the ICU for pulmonary care. So what I'm looking at as far as how do we keep people safe during COVID, I will apply that right on through to flu season also for my clients. Next slide, please. So what do I think about for pulmonary considerations when we get in the pool? Because this is where folks have the greatest chance of issues and where you just really need to be wise. The pressure of the water increases, the pressure of the water on the chest increases the difficulty of breathing. So on the one side, it's a great exercise and I love it for that. On the other side, it can, with that increased challenge in breathing, it can cause anxiety, you can feel short of breath. And so we need to be really mindful of that. Uh, when I have folks that 
are first getting in the water, this may be their first time and they feel that anxiety, that shortness of breath, sometimes I need to lift them up out of the water just to take some of that pressure off their chest until they can, their body can regulate to the water pressure. Um, oftentimes we just need to come in really slowly and talk about deep breathing because as you get in, if you're already breathing, you already have your chest actively expanding, then you're ready for that pressure of the water to come in. Um, and sometimes we get in and we just get people on their back and that can take that pressure off. They feel more accommodated to the situation, to the environment, and then we can bring folks back up, right? Um, and they're ready to deal with that pressure of the water on their chest. Next slide, please. But for folks that need active pulmonary support during the day, you may well also need it at the pool. And so I ask that any of our clients that use vent support during the day, if they're a regular BiPAP user, or they're a regular suction user that comes to the pool. We, as I said earlier, I work in a community pool most of the time. I do see folks that are on um, blow by ventilators, so they're not traked, but they have a blow by ventilator. Uh, and we see folks on those all the time. We pull their chair with our ventilator next to the pool. We get extra long tubing so they can use it when they need it. Sometimes we have it with them all the time if that's their best support. Uh, and it's great. If I have folks that do use that blow by ventilation system, I, oh, I insist that they have a AMBU bag on the back of their chair in case we have a some sort of power issue and we need to provide extra pulmonary support. Uh, and I have had to use that periodically. It has been incredibly useful uh, and it's just a good safety backup when we have folks that are on ventilators. The APTA says that kids and adults with invasive or trach ventilation are not suitable for the water. I know that some of you have children or are adults that are on trach ventilation and you are in the water. I ask that you be um, very careful. In every national conference I've been at, I have had the opportunity to work with families that have loved ones that are trach. And the independence that they have had on the water is spectacular. But the level of care and attention to detail has to be there to make sure that um, your loved one with the trach is safe and well supported. So um, keep that in mind as you are looking to different water opportunities for your loved one. If you use suction regularly, regularly, like not just when you're sick, but more often than that, for either yourself or your child, it needs to be poolside. It needs to be poolside, in case I didn't say that before. Uh, if we come into a situation, right, we're doing a lot of moving, we're doing a lot of deep breathing. If, you're, if your pulmonary system is likely to throw some mucus, we need the ability to deal with that quickly. So having it in the locker room or having it in the car is too far. Um, and so we do ask for all of our clients that use it regularly that it's poolside. Next slide, please. So for airway safety, we use neck collars. They can provide great stability. They can provide improved independence, but they are not life jackets. They are not life-saving devices. If you cannot right yourself in the pool, should you get flipped or someone walk by quickly and toss a big wave your way, someone has to be in the water, arms length, eyes on all the time because these are not life-saving, these are not life-saving devices. Um, there's lots of different types. These are three examples we use in our practice. There are probably three or four more that we have. So here's my plug for national conference next year. Come on out to national conference because I'll bring all of our net colors and you can try the one, you can try them all and figure out which one is best for you. I get asked frequently, which one is the best one? Because that's the one I want for myself or I want for my spouse or my child. And I'll tell you, I don't, I don't really know because I have, 
patients that I think are gonna love that yellow one because it's gonna provide some great support. And we put it on and they're like, oh my gosh, this is too tight on my head. I want that black one. And it's perfect for them. Great. It doesn't provide the same support, but they feel better in it. They feel more supported. Um, and it's really a matter of picking which one is best for you. So come to National Conference and try them out. Next slide, please. And how do we work with COVID safety? So we got airway safety with the head collars, but COVID safety, that's a whole different ball of wax. Um, my hair looked pretty much like that when we went into COVID lockdown last time, trying to deal with multiple state agencies, county agencies, city agencies, trying to figure out how can we get folks back in the pool safely in the time of a pandemic. But further on for me, how can I apply this, as I said, to flu season, which for a lot of my clients that are immunocompromised is very daunting. Um, so how, what, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna figure this out? Can we get in a pool? And for five months in my state, all pools were locked down. There was no choice. Um, how do you, how do face masks work in a pool? Um, they don't. They get wet and then you can't breathe. So that's not a great option. Um, and so we had to dismiss that per CDC uh, recommendations pretty early because clearly pulmonary function is important to us. And if we already have folks that are feeling a little bit um, compromised with the water pressure, putting a wet face mask on is not gonna help. So no face masks um, in our practice for the most part. How do we do this in a community pool? And how do we protect patients um, and the community during this time? So next slide, as we worked with um, multiple agencies, you can see on the left, Krista and I uh, wound up using face shields. Um, we come from the Seattle area. And if you were, Attentive to all the different plagues that seem to hit our world last year. We have murder hornets up here, uh, a little bit further north. So these beekeeper looking face shields, um, we tell everyone protects us from the murder hornets too. And so far, uh, we have not had any murder hornets in the pool, which has been great. Um, and those cloth um, shields, although probably wouldn't protect us from murder hornets, do just give us one more layer of um, support with a face shield, which we know are not as effective as um, face masks. But again, with the CDC require, with the CDC stating that face masks in the pool were not appropriate, this was our next best choice. And so to get back in the pool in a community setting to protect our clients um, and ourselves, the picture on the right is what it wound up looking like in our scenario. So we had face shields um, and our patients all had face shields. And that, and everyone was screened of course, um, before coming in the building. And that worked really well for us. We had no COVID incidents. We had no um, outbreaks or transmissions that we were ever notified of. At this point with the vaccination rate where they're at. If you are vaccinated um, and in the pool with us, you do not need to wear your face shield. The community has never needed to wear a face shield when they're just in for exercise. Um, we just, because of our close proximity to our patients, we had ourselves and our patients in face shields. So if you're vaccinated, it's now your choice. Um, and we continue to wear our face shields because by state regulation, uh, we are required to as healthcare providers. So our young kids are all still wearing their face shields if they can. Some of our really little ones, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. We spend more time playing with the face shield than we do actually getting therapy done. But for the most part, this has worked really quite effectively. Next slide, please. So what do you wanna think about 
We've thought about airway safety. We've thought about COVID safety. Now what about actually the pool? What do you want to think about when you're getting in a pool, any pool, whether this is a pool that you have at home, a community pool, the pool at grandma's condo, what do you want to think about? First off, what is the right temperature for you? A therapy temperature is anywhere from 90 to 95 degrees. Most of my clients at 90 degrees are too cold. Um, they get really stiff and we generally don't carry on. We run our therapy pool between 92 and 93 degrees. For us, that works well for folks that are working on balance, that are full-time chair users, um, so they can't move fast enough to keep their body temp up, um, or just in general are not moving fast enough that they get too hot in that environment. A lap pool runs between 80 and 82 degrees. Most of the, my clients cannot keep their body temp up in that cool of water. An instructional pool, which is like your YMCA um, instructional pool, that tends to run between 86 and 88 degrees. For folks that are marginal ambulators, for folks that are full-time ambulators, oftentimes you can keep your, you can keep moving fast enough that you can keep your body temperature up. And that 86 to 88 degree water is nice because you don't get too hot. So that water temperature really depends on who you are and how much support your body needs in keeping its core temp up. A hot tub generally runs between 100 and 104 degrees. That is too hot for most kids. That is too hot for any kid. Uh, I have multiple adults that have rigged their hot tub with a lift or they are able to access it and they love getting in their hot tub at night, taking that pressure off their back and their hips and just relaxing. Um, great for adults. That temperature is too hot for kids. That being said, I have a lot of families that have hot tubs. They turn it down for the kids during the week. So it runs between 92 and 93. If it's a completely outdoor hot tub, may turn it up to 95. Um, because especially in the Seattle area, it can be chilly. So we warm the water up just a little bit. And then on the weekends, we crank it a little bit higher for mom and dad and they get in and enjoy the tub. You wanna think about what are your access points? How are you gonna get into the water? Can you walk into the water on your own? Can you climb into the hot tub by yourself? Do you need a deck lift? Would that be your safest point of entry like we saw a few slides ago? I am thankful the pool I work in has two deck lifts, one in the shallow end, which for those folks that need more support on entry is perfect. And one in the deep end for folks that need to get right in and be at that mid chest level, that 75% body weight removed in standing. And I have a lift that will put most adults right in at that space. We also have wheelchairs so I can transfer someone into a wheelchair that I can drive straight into the pool. And for some folks, that is their best point of entry. So really look at the facility, look at what pool you're trying to access and figure out how you're going to access it safely. The other thing to consider with any pool is how is that water cared for? Is it purified with chlorine? Does it have um, infrared? Is it salt water purified? For some folks, your skin will really be affected by different forms of water care. And so you want to know before you get into a pool, how do you, how does your facility care for the water or how are you caring for that water at home or at grandma's hot tub or wherever you're accessing? Next slide, please. COVID helped with pool creativity. I loved watching different things pop up as the pandemic got going and people started realizing that these community pools that we have accessed for decades, all of a sudden were not there. In my region, several of those pools still are not available to us. Some will open for the summer, some will not open until the fall. People realize that if I'm gonna get in, if I'm gonna experience that independence, I better be creative. I gotta come up with a way to do this. So this um, is super cute. You can't really see the floating pink flamingo over there, but they have a pink flamingo in their hot pink pool. This is a 
um, a giant feeding trough like you would get at a farm supply store. If you go on Pinterest, there are multiple different sites that will show you how to make a pool out of it. For some folks, this is great. If you have someone, a young kid, this is perfect. If you just want to get in and float, this is fine. This depth will be great for you. If you're six feet tall and want to stand up, this depth isn't going to work. And this is not the spot um, where you want to be creative, but you still want to think outside the box. What can I do next? Um, next slide, please. So as we're thinking about concepts for a home pool, cost plays into it. How much am I going to spend to build a pool? What space do I have? Do I have space? If you don't want to get a permit from your local jurisdiction, doing one of those feeding trough pools is great because it just sits on the ground. There are some that have them. I've seen uh, pictures of indwelling trough pools where they just dig a hole right in their backyard, but the hole is only three or four feet deep. So that works out great. You don't need to get big permits for that. Some people do pools like you see here on the right. Uh, this pool was put in on an elevated deck. So they don't, they didn't have to get permits for an indwelling pool. In our region, that can be really challenging. They put this right on top of their deck. You can't see it, but there's a track system overhead so they can access it. They can easily get from their chairs into the pool and back into their chairs. Um, but there's some cost that goes with that that's different than putting in a feeding trough. Uh, I have a lot of people that in this time of COVID did hot tubs. And we looked at ways to creatively access those hot tubs um, for folks that are full-time chair users. And we came up with some great ways that are working well for folks getting in and out. Um, so you want to look at cost. You have to look at your space. You have to look at how many people can use the pool that you're thinking of. If this pool is designed really for one person, that's great, but the pool will be used more and better maintained the more people in the family have buy into that space, the more people that are invested in the pool. So this pool um, had two family members that used it for therapy. They used it multiple times a week. Um, because of the access, it was super easy. The right out the door is a roll-in shower that was just the shower to their bathroom. They just put a shower, they just put a door out the back side of their shower, and it was great for pool access um, and shower access post. So that was great. Mom was a triathlete. So at the far end under the pool cover uh, are the jets, and mom would train for triathlons on the weekends. And so mom had great buy-in and dad would get in and just relax. The whole family used it. Everyone was bought into it. Uh, and that pool was used at least five days a week, which means that it's going to be maintained. Um, and every, that's a common family activity that everybody can do and everybody's invested in. You also want to look at how are you going to access the water now, right? I told you this, this has a track. Um, so if that's what you need now, that's great. If you don't need that support now, if you do need that support down the future, down the road, how are you going to adapt your hot tub, your deck pool, your hot pink feeding trough to meet your motor needs then? So start to think about, especially if you're investing a lot from a cost side, how am I going to modify this? in the future to make this long-term investment truly be a good long-term investment. Next slide, please. So we figured out how to be safe. We figured out both from an airway side and from a pulmonary side, you've built your home pool or your community center is open and they have protocols in place where you feel safe for either yourself or your family member to be in the water. So where are you going to start? Pulmonary and trunk, pulmonary and trunk, because these are the places where folks get in trouble. Next slide, please. Almost every activity I come up with 
has these two items at some level in the back of my head. When we get in the pool, I'm always thinking of how am I engaging breathing into what we're doing? And how can I get trunk muscles, abs working in the aquatic environment? Because if you are mobility challenged, either uh, you are a chair user, you use canes, walking is exhausting, getting trunk activity, getting your abs engaged can be really hard and the water's the perfect place to do it. Um, I'm always thinking of these things because pulmonary issues are what get folks in the hospital every winter, right? That's where we get stuck. So whatever I can do to provide pulmonary strength, to provide um, access to getting maximal lung expansion and moving everything else at the same time, I'm all about that. I'm all about coordinating breathing with movement because holding your breath when you're trying to move is not a functional long-term activity. Breathing is a life essential skill as we know. So one way I get at that is by talking or singing. My kids that I work with, we sing the ABCs. Um, sometimes, I'm not as good at this, but uh, other therapists will sing uh, the whole Disney showcase. I don't, I don't know all the Disney songs, but she does and her patients do. And so that's great. And I'm much better at Moana than I used to be for sure. Um, but anytime we're singing, we're breathing. Anytime we're talking about your favorite Mexican food or your local sports team, you're breathing because you've got to take a breath and exhale. We're talking. And so that is a great way for me to make sure folks are breathing. And so we keep them engaged that way. And when I have people doing their own exercises, I want you to sing a tune. I want you to hum to yourself. So you are self-checking that you're breathing. So what are some of this, some, what do pulmonary and trunk exercises look like in real life? Next slide, please. If you were at my presentation earlier this week, you saw um, Kristen, we talked a lot about how to get arms up and away from your body and trunk support and what does that look like? So here's Krista in upright. She's got these floats that automatically bring her arms up and away from her body that expand the side of her chest. And if I had her singing Moana, because I know she can sing Moana, then I would know she was breathing and I was getting all aspects of her trunk involved. Um, the little girl on the right who is having a great time also has her arms up and away from her body. I think she too can sing Moana and she might be here, which is how we know she's engaged. And so she'll bring those balls up over her head and then she can bring them down and throw them at her mom or her therapist. And then she'll take them back up and bring them back up over her head. She can do the same thing with her legs to get her legs open and closed to stretch her hips out. And this is a great, these are both great fun activities to keep shoulder motion and to maximize pulmonary support. Krista has on the left, has all that water pressure on her chest that she's got to deal with and that she's working to breathe against. On the right, she's on her back. So she doesn't have all that water pressure on her chest and she can work. So she has no resistance in the front of her chest, making breathing a little bit easier but can work to breathe against the water on the side of her chest and really get those ribs stretched out. And I love this activity for that. Arms up, chest stretched out, everything feels good. Next slide, please. The waters are limitless. Safety first 100% of the time. No one's ever in the water without another set of eyes, whether you're an expert swimmer or whether you use a neck float to keep your airway safe. I always have someone um, eyes on because the water always has an element where we need to have that extra set of, uh, that extra point of security. 
folks that use the pool are the greatest creators of the next best item. This pool ring you see on the left is a regular noodle and they cut up some other regular noodles to put around because that's where uh, she needs her supports. Uh, the person that uses this is a full-time power chair user. But when I put this on her and she's in the water, she can walk independently in the pool. She can deep water run independently. Of course, I'm close by in case she loses her balance. But she can use this. They, her, she and her family devised this very simple $2 item that gives her the perfect support where she feels stable and has control. Pool users are the greatest creators of the next best item. So you get some noodles and some 777 glue, just like we have here, and you create the, the best thing for you. I had a family come to national conference a couple years ago, and they said, you know, the best thing for us is this monofin. And some pools don't like the monofin. Um, and I'll tell you, the pool at national conference wasn't too excited about the monofin. But it was the greatest tool for that swimmer. It allowed her to be completely independent in swimming. And the joy and the pride that she had in that, the independent exercise that she found in that, a really easy item, provided independence. And when we could explain that to the staff, they were great. A lot of pools will not allow you to bring in outside equipment. So I encourage you, if you have a monofin or you've made your own noodle, take that to the pool manager before you get in the water, before you have an interaction with the lifeguard and say, this is what we have. This is why we have it. And I need to make sure that we can maximize our independence here and that this is approved. And deal with that before you get in the water. Um, with the manager. So when that lifeguard comes up and says, hey, we don't allow outside equipment, you've already handled it because that's what allows you or your child independence in the water. And if you put a pool in your home, maximize it for the greatest number of people because that's where you and your family are gonna get the greatest joy in that environment where you're gonna be more independent, Take that pressure off your spine, maximize your motion, and really find a joy in a gravity-free environment. Next slide, please. Thank you. So coming today to this virtual national conference, for getting excited about getting the pool in your own space, and hopefully getting excited about getting the pool uh, next year at National Conference when we all are back in the water and we can play with head collars and floats and weights and we can share stories about what works for you and get ideas about what could work better. I look forward to that time uh, and I encourage you to really explore and be curious now. The freedom that is found outside of gravity is indescribably wonderful. Have a great day and thanks for coming to this this conference. I really appreciate it. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, that was such a, a great presentation. And again, thank you for, for joining us virtually here. Um, we truly appreciate everything you, you shared today. And thank you to everyone who joined in today. There is a, a survey linked in the, session, in the sessions page and you will also be receiving a follow-up email that has that survey link and we welcome any feedback that you have to share with us. Once again, we are incredibly thankful for the support from our sponsors for making the 2021 Virtual SMA Conference possible. And don't forget to join us this evening for the SMA Conference Community Closing Social at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And this is really a spot to help close out the conference this past week. Uh, be sure to wear your Cure SMA um, Conference t-shirt or other Cure SMA gear that you have. And if there's anything that we can do for you, or if you have any additional questions, please email us at familysupport at curesma.org. Thank you all so much. Have a great day, everyone. And again, thank you for joining us for the 2021 Virtual SMA Conference.